Welcome everyone to theCUBE's presentation of the AWS Startup Showcase, Open Cloud Innovations. This is season two, episode one of the ongoing series and we're covering exciting and innovative startups from the AWS ecosystem. Today, we're going to focus on the open source community. I'm your host, Dave Vellante, and right now we're going to talk about open source security and mitigating risk in light of a recent discovery of a zero day flaw in Log4j, a Java logging utility, and a related White House executive order that points to the FTC pursuing companies that don't properly secure consumer data as a result of this vulnerability. And with me to discuss this critical issue and how to more broadly address software supply chain risk is Donald Fisher, who's the CEO of Tidelift. Thank you for coming on the program, Donald. Oh, thanks for having me, excited to be here. Yeah, pleasure. So look, there's a lot of buzz. You, you open the news, you go to your favorite news site and you see this, you know, Log4j, which is a project, uh, otherwise known as Log4Shell. It's this logging tool. My understanding is it's, it's both ubiquitous and very easy to exploit. Maybe you could explain that in a little bit more detail and how do you think this vulnerability is going to affect things this year? Yeah, happy, happy to dig in a little bit and, and orient around this. So, um, you know, just a little uh, definitions to start with. So Log4j is a uh, very widely used um, uh, source uh, component that's been around for quite a while. It's actually an amazing piece of technology. Log4j is used in practically every serious enterprise Java application um, over the last 10 going on 20 years. So it's, uh, you know, Log4j itself is fantastic. Um, the challenge that uh, organization, organizations have been facing uh, relate to a specific security vulnerability that was uh, discovered uh, in Log4j. Um, and that has been given this uh, sort of brand name as it happens these days. Uh, folks may remember Heartbleed around the uh, open SSL vulnerability some years back. This one has been dubbed Log4Shell. And the reason why it was given that name, uh, that name is that this is a form of security vulnerability that actually allows uh, attackers, you know, if a system is found that hasn't been patched uh, to remediate it, it allows hackers to um, get full control of a uh, of a system, of a server that has the software running on it or includes this log4j component. Um, and that means that they can do anything. They can uh, access, uh, you know, private customer data on that system or, or really do anything into a so-called shell level access. So um, you know that's the sort of definitions of what it is. The, the reason why it's important is uh, in the in the small you know this is a open door, right? It's uh, if, if organizations haven't patched this, they need to uh, respond to it. But one of the things that's kind of you know I think important to recognize here is that um, this log4j is just one of literally thousands of independently created open source components that flow into the applications that almost every organization uh, built um, and. All of them, uh, all software is going to have security vulnerabilities. Uh, and so I think that Log4j is, has been a catalyst for organizations to say, okay, we got to solve this you know, specific problem. We also have to think ahead about how is this all going to work if our software supply chain uh, originates with independent creators across thousands of projects across the internet, how are we going to put a better um, plan in place to think ahead to the next Log4j, uh, Log4Shell style incident uh, and for sure there will be more. Okay, so you see this incident as a catalyst to maybe more broadly thinking about how to secure the, the, the digital supply chain. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, this is proving a, a point that you know, a variety of folks have been making for a number of years. Hey, we depend, to, I mean, honestly, uh, these days, more than 70% of most applications, most custom applications are comprised of this third party open source code projects very similar in origin and governance to Log4j. That's just reality. It's actually great. That's an amazing uh, thing that the uh, humans collaborating on the internet have caused to be possible that we have this rich commons of open source software to build with. But we also have to be practical about it and say, hey, how are we going to work together to make sure that that software um, as much as possible is vetted to ensure that it meets uh, commercial standards, enterprise standards ahead of time and then when the inevitable um, issues arise, like this um, incident around the Log4j library, that we have a great plan in place to respond to it and to uh, you know, close, the, uh, close the door on vulnerabilities when they, when they show up. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, you know, when you listen to the high level narrative, it's easy to point fingers at organizations, hey, you're not doing enough. Now, of course, the US government has definitely made attempts 
uh, to emphasize this and, and shore up and, 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 and push people to shore up the software supply chain. They've released an executive order last May, but, but specifically, I mean, it's, this is a complicated situation. So what steps should organizations really take to make sure that they don't fall prey to these future supply chain attacks, which you know, are, as you pointed out, are inevitable? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great um, point that you make that the, the U.S. federal government has uh, taken proactive steps uh, starting last year, 2021, um, in the fallout of the um, solar winds uh, breach, uh, you know, about 12 months ago from the time that we're talking, talking here. Um, the U.S. government actually was a bit ahead of the, the game, both in flagging the severity of this, um, uh, you know, uh, area of concern and also directing um, organizations on how to respond to it. So the, um, in May of 2021, the White House issued an executive order on cybersecurity, and it um, uh, directed federal agencies to undertake a whole bunch of new uh, measures to ensure the security of different aspects of their um, technology and software supply chain. It specifically called out um, open source uh, software as an area where they put you know, hard requirements around um, federal agencies when they're acquiring technology. And one of the things that the federal government that the White House Cybersecurity Executive Order directed was that organizations need to start with uh, creating a list of the third party open source that's flowing into their applications, just to even have a table of contents, an index to start working with. And that's, that's called uh, a software bill of materials or SBOM is how some people uh, pronounce that uh, acronym. Um, so the, the federal government basically requires federal agencies to um, now create an SBOM for their applications to demand a uh, software bill of materials um, from vendors that are doing business with the government. And the strategy there has been to um, expressly use the purchasing power of the U.S. government to level up um, uh, industry as a whole and uh, create the necessary incentives for organizations to, uh, to take this seriously. You know, I, I feel like the solar winds uh, hack that you mentioned, of course it was it widely affected the government, so we kind of woke them up. Uh, but I feel like it, it was almost like a stuck set, Stuxnet moment, Donald, where very sophisticated, I mean, for the first time, patches that were supposed to be helping us protect, now we have to be careful of them. And you mentioned the, the bill of software bill of materials, we have to really inspect that. And so let's get to what you guys do. How do you help organizations deal with this problem and, and secure their open source software supply chain? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to tell you about, uh, about Tidelift and, uh, and how we're looking to help. Um, so, you know, the company, I uh, co-founded the company with uh, a couple of uh, colleagues, all of whom are, um, long-term open source folks. Uh, you know, I've been working in around commercializing open source for the last 20 years at companies like uh, Red Hat and, uh, and a number of others, uh, as have my, my co-founders. Um, the opportunity that we saw is that, um, you know, while there have been vendors for some of the traditional um, systems level open source components and uh, um, stacks like uh, Linux, uh, you know, of course there's Red Hat and other vendors for Linux or um, for Kubernetes or for some of the databases, uh, you know, there's standalone companies. For these log for shell style projects, there just hasn't been a vendor for them. And part of it is there's a challenge to cover a really vast territory. Uh, a typical enterprise that we um, uh, inspect has you know, upwards of 10,000 log for shell, log for J like components flowing into their application. So how do they get a hand around their hands around that challenge of managing that and ensuring it meets you know, reasonable commercial standards? That's what Tidelift sets out to do. And we do it through a combination of two elements. Um, both of which are fairly unique in the market. The first of those is a purpose-built um, software solution that we've created that um, uh, keeps track of the third-party open source flowing into your applications, inserts itself into your um, DevSecOps tool chain, your developer um, uh, tooling, your application development process. And you, know, you can kind of think of it as next to the point in your release process where you run your unit test to ensure the business logic in the code that your team is writing uh, is accurate and sort of passes tests. We do a, a inspection to look at the state of the third party open source packages like Apache Log4j that are flowing into your, into your um, application. So there's a software element to it that's a multi-tenant SaaS service. Um, we're excited to be partnered with, uh, with AWS. And one of the reasons why we're, we're here in this venue talking about how we uh, are making that available jointly with AWS to, to uh, joint customers deploying on AWS platforms. 
Now, the other piece of the of our solution is really, really unique, and that's the set of um, relationships that Tidelift has built directly with these independent open source maintainers, the folks behind these open source packages that organizations rely on. And uh, you know, this is where we sort of had this idea: somebody is making that software in the first place, right? Uh, and so. Would those folks be interested? Could we create a set of aligned incentives to um, uh, encourage them to make sure that that software meets a bunch of enterprise standards in areas around security, like uh, you know, relating to the log4j vulnerability, um, but also other complicated parts of open source consumption, like licensing and open source license accuracy and compatibility, um, and also maintenance, like is somebody looking after the software going forward? So just trying to basically um, uh, invite open source uh, creators to partner with us to level up their packages. Through those relationships, we get um, really, really uh, clean, uh, clear first party data from the folks who create and maintain the software. And we can flow that through the tools that I described so that end organizations um, can know that they're building with uh, open source components that have been vetted to meet these standards. By the way, there's a really cool side effect of this business model, which is that we pay these open source maintainers to do this work with us. And so now we're creating a new income stream around what you know previously had been primarily a volunteer activity done for impact in this universe of open source software. We're helping these open source maintainers kind of go pro on an aspect of what they do around open source. And that means they can spend more time uh, applying more process and tools and methodology to making that open source software even better. And that's good for our customers and it's good for everyone who relies on open source software, which is really everyone in society these days. That's interesting. I was going to ask you, what's their incentive other than doing the right thing? Can you give us an example of, of uh, maybe an example of an open source maintainer that you're working with? Yeah, I mean, we're working with hundreds of open source maintainers and uh, a few of the key um, open source uh, foundations in different areas across JavaScript, Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, .NET, and you know, like examples of categories of projects that we're working with. Just to be clear, are things like uh, you know web frameworks or uh, parser libraries or logging libraries like uh, you know Log4j and all the other languages, right? Or um, you know time and date manipulation libraries. I mean, they, these are sort of the um, you know kind of core building blocks of applications, and individually they. You know, they may seem like uh, you know uh, maybe a minor uh, minor thing, but when you multiply them across how many applications these get used in, and Log4j is a really really clarifying case <laughs> for folks to understand this. Um, you know, what is seemingly a small part of your overall um, application estate can have disproportionate impact uh, on on your operations, as we saw with many organizations that spent you know a weekend or a week or a large part of the holidays scrambling to patch and remediate this uh, single vulnerability in one of those thousands of packages, uh, in that case, log for Okay, got it. So you have this two, two headed, uh, you know, two vectors. The, the, I'm going to call it your ecosystem, your relationship with these open source maintainers is kind of a, it, that, that just didn't happen overnight. You had to develop those relationships and now you get first party data. You monetize that with a software service that is purpose built as obviously the monitor, the probe that actually tracks that third third party, you know, activity. So exactly, that, right? yeah, you got it. Okay, cool. you got it. So a lot of companies, Donald. I mean, this is like I said before, it's a complicated situation. You know, a lot of people don't have the skill sets to, to deal with this, uh, and so many companies just kind of stick their head in the sand and you know hope for the best. <laughs> But that's not a great strategy. What are the implications for organizations if they don't really put the tools and processes into place to manage their open source digital supply chain? Yeah, ignoring the problem is not a viable strategy anymore. Um, you know, and it's just become increasingly clear as these um, big headline incidents have happened, like Heartbleed and Solar Winds, and uh, now this uh, Log for Shell vulnerability. So you can you can bet on that continuing um, uh, into the future. Um, and organizations, I think, are, are are realizing the ones that haven't gotten ahead of this problem are realizing this is a critical issue that they need to address. But they have help, right? Uh, you know, the the federal government. Um, another action beyond that cybersecurity executive order that was directed at federal agencies early last year, um, just uh, in the last uh, week or so, the uh, FTC, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, has made a much more direct uh, warning 
to uh, private companies uh, and industry saying that, you know, issues like this log4j vulnerability risk exposing uh, uh, private, uh, uh, you know, consumer data. Um, that is one of the express uh, uh, mandates of the FTC is to avoid that. Um, the FTC has said that this is, um, you know, uh, uh, bears on both the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act as well as the Graham Leach Bliley Act, which relates to consumer data privacy. And the FTC just came right out and said it. They said they cited the seven hundred million dollar settlement uh, that Equifax was subject to for their data breach that also related to an open source right. uh, component. By the way, that that uh, had not been patched by by Equifax, and they said the FTC intends to use its full legal authority to pursue companies that fail to take reasonable steps to protect consumer data from exposure as a result of Log4j or similar known vulnerabilities in the future. So the FTC is saying, you know, this is a cons critical issue for consumer privacy and consumer data. We are going to enforce against companies that do not take reasonable precautions. What are reasonable precautions? I think it's kind of a mosaic of solutions, but I'm glad to say um, Tidelift is contributing a really a different and novel um, solution to the mix that we hope will help organizations contend with this and avoid that kind of enforcement action from FTC or other regulators. Well, and the, the good news is that you can tap uh, a tooling like Tidelift in the cloud uh, as a service uh, and you know, much easier today than it was 10 or 15 years ago to, to resolve, uh, or at least begin to demonstrate that you're taking action uh, against this problem. Absolutely. There's uh, new challenges now uh, moving into a world where we build on a foundation of uh, independently created open source. We need new solutions uh, and new ideas. And that's, uh, you know, that's part of what we're, uh, we're, we're uh, showing up with from the tide lift angle. But there's many other elements that are going to be necessary to uh, provide the full solution around uh, securing the open source supply chain going forward. Well, Donald Fisher of, of Tidelift, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and best of luck to your organization. Thanks for the good work that you guys do. Thanks, Dave. Really appreciate your uh, uh, partnership on uh, this, getting the word out. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for today. All right, you're very welcome. And you are watching the AWS Startup Showcase, Open Cloud Innovations. Keep it right there for more action on theCUBE, your leader in enterprise tech coverage.